Hi, this is Gary Auden, and welcome to this EduCast, WebRTC support for Internet Explorer and Safari, plugins required. It's sponsored by Temesis and Telecom Reseller. And today we have with us Chip Wilcox, who's the CEO of Temesis Corporation, who's gonna participate in a few minutes. But let's talk about what we're gonna talk about so you understand what you're getting into. What is WebRTC and why is it important? the interest that's developing to get WebRTC and every browser that's out there today, the state of the standards and where you can get them, talk more about Internet Explorer and Safari and how they relate to WebRTC. Chip will be bringing something to you which is very interesting, a free plugin for WebRTC for Internet Explorer and Safari. We'll discuss a basic implementation, a couple of applications of it that I think you'll find very interesting, and then the development platform they have as well called Skylink. So Chuck, let's start off with the new way, WebRTC. What is this all about? Okay, so, well, first of all, thanks for having me here today. Um, we're very excited about web real-time communications. Um, it's really the first um, technology that was built from the ground up to facilitate real-time communication and, in fact, real-time interaction, uh, primarily uh, intended for web browsers. Um, but actually works on any internet-connected device, um, and that's one of the things that we'll talk about in a little bit. And today, it, uh, it's supported, WebRTC is, by Google, Mozilla, and Opera browsers natively. And um, WebRTC actually emerged as part of uh, the new HTML5, W3C, and IETF standards after Google acquired two companies, um, Global IP Sound, or GIPS, and onto, and then took their technology, which was fantastic, and then open sourced it. So back in late 2011 or early 2012, uh, people started working with WebRTC, and since then it has evolved into what is now very close to being a new standard for real-time communications uh, on the internet, um, which is extremely exciting. And if you look at the history of how the internet has evolved, this really is the next logical step for bringing uh, communication to everyone online. But you know, Jeff, that we have a pro I have a problem with this and this, why is this so important? And it's gotta be multiple reasons, not just simply this is cool. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> of course it's cool. And I mentioned already that it was really the first, it's the first technology that I've seen that was really built to facilitate real-time interactivity online. It's also extremely cost-effective as in close to free, but it's not necessarily easy. So we're you know, you're seeing the costs or the barriers to entry for people who want to engage in online communication dropping with this technology being introduced to the market. It's platform and device independent. So as long as you have a browser uh, and in many cases a, a, a mobile device that has the capability to serve an application, you can actually incorporate WebRTC functionality as part of that. It's got better encryption than any of the other commercial video uh, solutions out there today. The audio and video codecs are the best that you can find uh, and will only get better as we go on. And you've also got a, a very strong increase in the reliability of the technology uh, in terms of how things work uh, between browsers, between internet connected devices. So a lot of the big complaints that people have with the voice over IP uh, applications are really being solved with this new technology and we're seeing a lot of shift from, for example, uh, SIP and voice over IP applications to now using WebRTC on the back end to support that same application um, with different businesses. And along with all of this, what this is really doing is turning a technology that used to be strongly in the domain of tel telecommunications engineers, video signal processing and audio signal processing engineers into something which is accessible by web developers. So you're really speeding up the time to market for people who are building applications that engage uh, communication as a feature as part of those applications. Now you mentioned the word standards, all right? And there are multiple parties participating in the standards. So who are we talking to when we talk about standards? Well, Google was the primary uh, antagonist, if you want to call them that, in terms of making WebRTC a standard. Uh, they then engaged with Mozilla to come up with the first demonstration of the technology and interoperability. 
between their browsers, Firefox and Chrome, which is one of the uh, prerequisites that you have to have before you can actually promote something and, and start to try and make it a standard. And there are about six other companies, not all of whom I can remember their names, that actually actively write and support and provide code back to Google um, as the sponsor of the standard to help make the open source um, mature and uh, worthy of being called a standard. So Thomas is also one of those companies, albeit we're quite small compared to people like Google, Microsoft, <laughs> um, Apple, you know, any of the other browser vendors. <clears throat> but you also have companies like Ericsson Research and Vonage and, you know, um, Guardian, people like that that come in and from a lot of different backgrounds, they all try and support and make the standard come to fruition. Um, and that's really what's been happening over the last couple of years. And one of the things that's recently come out, and one of the reasons why we did the um, did the WebRTC plugin was because there are some browser vendors that aren't aren't participating as actively or not supporting WebRTC as much as we would like. One of those two is Apple. So you'll see here we talk a little bit about what Temesis does to support um, with Ericsson Research putting WebRTC into WebKit, which is a, a a very well-known rendering library uh, used by um, not just Apple for Safari on the desktop, but Apple uses a customized version of that for every browser on iOS. And there are also a lot of other platforms, including gaming box uh, companies, that use um, WebKit as the one of the components in their um, interface when they're setting up the user interfaces for those for those boxes. Whether it's a TV set-top box or a gaming uh, box, there are a number of different companies that build uh, hardware that use WebKit to help provide the user interface um, that they use. So there are a lot of different ways that we participate and help, and really our goal here is to try and make the technology mature and to bring it to market as fast as possible while also providing meaningful contributions back to the standards. Now, I looked up and found a number of standards here, which in one sense seem like there's a lot of standards, and in another sense seems like we're going to get some more of them. So kind of where are we with the standards? Well, when you look at the very top level, which is the, the area that I tend to focus on, our CTO really gets into the weeds and dives in on all of these um, specifics. Um, the W3C takes care of what happens in the browser and makes sure that everything that happens between browsers is standardized. And then the IETF takes care of all of the, the low-level protocols and um, specific components of the technology that end up rolling up to what you see when you get to the browser level. Um, it's a very complex organism uh, and organization. Um, there are a lot of different moving parts and a lot of interests that need to be represented. And uh, balancing those two, um, whether you're talking about the low-level protocols or whether you're talking about what happens between the browsers and HTML5, um, it's, it's uh, good bedtime reading if you have trouble sleeping uh, from my perspective. But there are also a lot of people that are very passionate about it. And, and a lot of these things have to all come together to make one video call work which I think is really amazing, that there is so much complexity underneath all of the uh, standards documentation, even at a high level, and that it all comes together when you click on a link in a URL and end up in a video call for the first time on a web browser. Let's talk about the browser for a minute, and browser integration. This is sort of set up as a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, but mm -hmm. why do we have servers in this picture? Well, <clears throat> the standard by itself says Here's how things need to work when you're doing uh, an interaction between web browsers. But it leaves completely open the idea of signaling. So it's agnostic, in a way, to what kind of signaling you might be using on the back end. And what that does is it makes it possible for people to use XMPP as a signaling protocol or um, SIP um, as a signaling protocol, or you can build it yourself and start from scratch, which is what Temesis has done. And that, so there's no standard for the signaling that happens on the back end. One of the reasons for this is because it'll, it allows people to take and use existing components 
if you've already got a voice over IP, you know, IP PBX system, or you've already built a whole stack on top of asterisks, you can very quickly get up and running with WebRTC just by repurposing your existing signaling infrastructure and tying that into the WebRTC um, components that you want to use. On the other hand, um, Thomas just feels like this is not really the best way to take the whole technology forward. And when we started up back in 2012, we really looked at what we thought would be the best way to do WebRTC. And we've invented our own way of doing signaling, which is working very well for us. The, uh, so that's really why there's a server here, is because you have to have some sort of way of connecting the two peers and doing session management. And that's all done with the signaling side of things. And then on top of that, if you need to engage a turn server or you need other types of servers like a media control unit or a scaling and forwarding unit, all of those things are servers that end up having to get involved in the interaction and sometimes, in fact, end up taking over the streams and management of the data flow between one peer to another. So at a basic level, you can get away with having minimal servers, but you have to have some kind of signaling in order to set up the interaction. Well, let's stop there for a minute because you've talked about the generic picture. Let's bring in Internet Explorer and Safari and where do they fit or don't fit in this environment? Well, you know, Google and Mozilla were first in terms of coming together and figuring out how to make WebRTC work between two different browsers. Apple and Microsoft have their own uh, take on how things should go. Microsoft has been pretty vocal um, about whether or not they will or will not support the standard. Initially, they said that they would not support WebRTC. Now they've, they are coming back to the table after having participated in the OpenRTC uh, um, kind of community group, because it's not really a standards um, committee yet, although we think that it will probably evolve into one. So what initially happened was that, you know, people were saying, well, WebRTC is really great, but Apple and Microsoft don't support it with their browsers. Um, and for us as a company, at a, at a very granular sort of micro level, what we found was that customers that we were talking with that wanted to, were excited about WebRTC were very wary of getting involved in using a technology that wasn't supported by Microsoft and or Apple. So <clears throat> the same thing happened everywhere. And, and about 18 months ago, I think, when I looked at one of the community boards, the top two challenges for anyone working with WebRTC was that um, they were getting pushback from potential users and customers uh, and, cl and investors even who were saying that because Microsoft and Apple weren't playing with the standards um, committee and weren't supporting it in their products, um, it made it very difficult for WebRTC to get traction. Um, at the same time, we felt that while Temesis had the capability to develop a solution, there were a lot of people out there who really felt that was a difficult challenge to start with. Once we started working and trying to understand how we could provide a solution that would allow WebRTC to work in Internet Explorer and Safari, we realized it was very difficult to start with and that the maintenance part of this whole process was what was going to end up killing anyone almost that uh, wanted to work with it. Because with the changes in the standard and releases of that code base every few weeks and um, six-week cycles for releases of the new browsers for Chrome and Firefox, there are a lot of moving parts. And inevitably, if you got something up and running, within a few weeks, uh, it would stop working because of changes to the browsers or changes to the underlying source code for, uh, for WebRTC. Well, that brings up really the next slide, which you've gathered some statistical information. Why support these two? Yeah, um, and this is another uh, thing. I'm, I'm very passionate. I love I love Google Chrome. Um, I use it as my primary browser. I use Mozilla Firefox a lot, and I do a lot of testing with Safari and, and now IE, of course. But I, I dug into this a lot, and, and it became really clear to me that in spite of the, the passion that people have and the fact that they love Chrome, Internet Explorer still has a huge market share. And that's whether you're talking about globally, just in general, or whether you're talking about the enterprise market, where it's even more prevalent, or you're talking about desktop browsers. And the first interact between um, Chrome and 
Firefox was on the desktop web browser. And in the enterprise world, which is where a lot of the traction for WebRTC is coming today, we see you have to support the enterprise if you want to support and build a business around WebRTC. So um, it made perfect sense to us at the time when we started working on our solution for this that, that we would promote this as a way of getting enterprise customers on board. Um, and that's what's very clear here. You know, if you walk into a company and you think about IT uh, security and how people get their computers locked down and don't have the ability sometimes to install their own software like Chrome, um, and IT departments want to keep things simple, they often go with plain vanilla installs of the OS and the browsers that are offered with that. You're stuck with Internet Explorer. And then you think about upgrade cycles, and even if Microsoft puts uh, WebRTC into the latest version of its Edge browser, it's probably not going to retrofit IE11, IE10, IE9. And those are all browsers that people are still using. You, you know, for example, IE9 is 10 years old, but there's still lots of companies that use it. So um, it really makes sense to have something that makes WebRTC work so we can all just get on with it and adopt that technology. Well, that's a wonderful lead into the next slide about your plugin. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and that was unrehearsed. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> back in May 2014, we had gotten to a point where we finally had what we felt was a, a robust enough solution to provide support for WebRTC and Internet Explorer and Safari. And we launched it as a really a free component to help accelerate the adoption of WebRTC. So our CTO dropped this uh, package onto the uh, public mailing list for WebRTC, and we started seeing people test it. And in fact, early adopters like Beastry um, were very helpful in terms of helping us test and, and very quickly make that solution more and more robust. And really, at that point, we started addressing those major point, pain points for anyone that wanted to support high end Safari users for the enterprise, for Internet Explorer. Um, education is a big vertical for Safari and Apple. Um, and what we did then was we said, look, we're doing this because in order for us to be successful, WebRTC has to be successful. For WebRTC to be successful, you have to support IE and Safari. <coughs> Excuse me. And we made this free to use with a commitment to support it indefinitely. So when it's no longer needed, we're happy to give up that um, that work to support the plugin. Um, and our promise was that we will implement the latest published draft of the WebRTC spec and we align the functionality of the plugin with the latest stable versions of Chrome and Firefox. So the way Chrome and Firefox support WebRTC at a base level um, in terms of the spec for WebRTC, when you install and use our plugin, it uh, makes it possible for your WebRTC service to work the same way in Internet Explorer and Apple Safari as it does in Chrome and Firefox. So let's talk about how that does work, the basics for us, please. Sure. Um, we went ahead and we actually took uh, a file called Adapter.js, which is a polyfill uh, component originally supplied by Google as part of the their open source package for WebRTC. It basically helps all the browsers understand how to interact with each other, and we modified that so that it would understand how to support interactions between Chrome, Firefox, and now Internet Explorer and Safari. Um, and this file is one of the two pieces that needs to be present for the plugin and our solution to work and for your WebRTC service to work. So when you come to our website and you look for information about the plugin, you'll see, okay, well, there's this adapter.js file. That needs to be installed within um, the service, so the application that a WebRTC uh, service provider has. And then that makes your service sort of plugin aware. And it basically just says, look, before I could only support Chrome and I could only support Firefox, now I know I can also support Internet Explorer and Safari, and it starts um, helping you address that issue when an end user comes to your service and wants to use it, but they're using what was before an incompatible browser. The second component is really on the client side. So when a user comes and visits your website or your service for WebRTC, they'll receive a pop-up alert that says, um, 
you are using a browser which would benefit from the use of this plugin, where before it would simply pop up an alert that says, sorry, your, your, your browser's not compatible with this service. End of story. Go download Chrome or something like that. So what we've done is we've gone ahead and now what happens is the user goes to the site, they're prompted to download the plugin, they go ahead and they install a very small package, they might in some cases need to refresh their browser and then they're able to use the service as originally intended but now on two new browsers whether it's Internet Explorer or Safari. But let's move on to the next question. Now, this is uh, all well and good but the point is we need to talk about commercially doing this and I noticed that you have multiple versions of this type of software. Hmm. Yeah, well we ended up um, People really liked what we did with the free version of the plugin, but they they also felt that in some cases they wanted to have more control over the experience for their users. And one of those at the first uh, entry was really, how do I, um, can I possibly rebrand your plugin with my own logos so that I don't lose that opportunity to reinforce my brand with my customers? Um, in some cases, uh, people would say, well, nobody really knows who Temesis is, and I would say, well, maybe not yet. But um, we went ahead and we started thinking through really how you could support even more functionality with the plugin, maybe things that aren't necessarily part of the standard, or maybe it's a gray area, maybe at some point it will be supported by the standard, but it's not yet. And that really gave us an opportunity to think about how to stack up different feature sets and then to offer commercial licensing opportunities to people if they wanted this kind of control over the user experience and the additional features that they could get, and which we were happy to provide. I mean, we have the expertise. It's really something, it, for us, it's a process management problem, um, and we understand, and, and we didn't think initially that the plugin would become a commercial opportunity for us, but it's actually turned into something that's uh, a nice helper in terms of generating revenue. So what we did was we designed sort of three different tiers, one of which is basically just a simple rebranding and making the plugin your own. So you go from the free version where we manage everything and it has our logos all over it to being able to put your own logos into the installer to control the update cycles so that you can match that to the cycles from your own service in terms of releases. Maybe you want to own and self-distribute the binary for the installer that's all fine. So you've got that package at the very basic level. Then you start moving up into things which are more, like I said, the gray areas in terms of the standard and maybe some additional features around service levels and and um, having access to some of the code if something happens and, um, you know, we decide to stop supporting the plugin and you still want to keep going with it. So um, that's really what you see here is the different levels of support and features that are available at each level of the package. And those jump up in price. So the very, you know, the, at a minimal level, um, there's one, um, we think, very reasonable small annual fee um, for just custom rebranding. And when you get up to the platinum level, it's more of a negotiation that happens between us and the customer as to what the price is going to be. I'd like you to discuss the, uh, the Citrus application and then the Rabbit application in a minute. Okay, um, so Citrix was one of our very early customers and they've been gracious enough to support us publicly with their implementation and the story behind that. Um, they have a service which is based entirely on WebRTC called GoToMeeting Free. Um, anyone and most of us have used GoToMeeting which is the software client that you download and install on your laptop or your computer and it allows you to do things like call recording, screen sharing, etc. Um, and it's a pretty heavy client. They also wanted to start extending their reach into, the, um, into users that might not yet be ready to pay for the fully licensed version of GoToMeeting, and they were willing to try WebRTC, and they were definitely looking for something that would support Internet Explorer because they're an enterprise-focused company. Um, and you'll see here, uh, if you go to GoToMeeting free, and this is what I encourage people to do is if you want to try it out, and see how a customized version of our plugin works in a specific situation, um, go to meeting free is one of those where the entire user experience from start to finish is branded Citrix. They've wrapped the plugin in their own installation package and their own um, process, and they've done a really nice job of showing how this experience can be great for the end user. And all of a sudden, you've got uh, an expanded audience with the potential to reach 40% more of the uh, users of the internet because those people are all using Internet Explorer. Let's talk about Rabbit now, which is another application you 
Spell yeah, it. Rabbit's, Rabbit's really cool. Um, they are really taking collaboration but making it social, right? So their whole premise is you should be able to share anything on the web, whether it's watching movies, listening to music, actually doing work, you know, the 15% of the time we do that while we're in the office, um, and doing that powered by WebRTC. And you can do things like go and watch a Netflix movie with 10 of your friends while you're uh, hanging out at Rabbit. And they were re really willing to start up and use our free plugin um, to begin with to see how that worked. And so as part of what we're doing with them, um, their focus really is on Safari users because for whatever reason they have an audience that is more oriented towards the Apple platform than the Windows platform. And they just started using the free plugin. Um, to start with, and that's been helpful to them in terms of building their audience, and they've been getting a lot of traction uh, in general, and again, they've been very gracious in terms of allowing us to talk about them and, and how we've helped them. And again, with the free plugin, um, we're available to help people uh, with problems or challenges um, in terms of implementation if needed, but it's really super easy. Rabbit got this thing up and running in less than a week. Um, for them, and they have a pretty complicated service. And again, they built a lot of the back end for their WebRTC service by themselves. Now, you've talked about Temesis, but could you tell us more about your company and its acceptance by customers? <clears throat> sure. Well, we started off, as I said, back in 2012, where we decided that we wanted to build a pure play WebRTC service. Um, we feel like as a result of all of that work that we've done, we're really helping lead the innovations in communications with WebRTC. Um, we are building a full stack platform as a service with uh, a complete set of front end development tools, whether you're talking about a JavaScript API or iOS and Android uh, development frameworks. We're now working on uh, desktop uh, SDKs, all powered by our back end uh, WebRTC service. And our goal is to really make it incredibly easy for developers and businesses to build and deploy communications features as part of any application, whether you're talking about a website, a mobile app, um, it could be a desktop or, or a, a TV set-top box. We'd like to be sort of the go-to company for providing um, the ability to embed communication as part of any user experience. Um, in terms of our team, we come from all over the place. Most of us have more than 15 years plus worth of work experience, but from a broad variety of industries, whether you're talking about telecom, e-commerce, digital media. And this is one of the things I think makes this exciting because we understand a lot of different use cases. And the whole purpose of what we're doing is to make it possible for almost anyone, whether you're talking about unified comms, which is a standard vertical for thinking about video uh, and collaboration, all the way through to Internet of Things type applications, um, drones, you know, Raspberry Pi based devices, um, all of those things, we've all come together with this whole idea that communication is awesome and we want to make it possible anywhere, uh, at any time on any device. So that's really what we're focused on. And I did put a few of our little customers over on the right, but that's really our purpose. And I would like you to just summarize your value because we've talked about a lot of things in this well, EduCast. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so with regard to the WebRTC plugin, whether you use the free version or the commercial version, our goal is to really help fill this huge gap in the market between the availability of WebRTC in some of the major browsers that are being used in the world, which include Internet Explorer and to a lesser extent Safari. WebRTC is really growing fast in terms of awareness, and people really want to use it. They understand the value that a simpler, easier to uh, deploy, and better technology can bring their businesses. Our job is to make this possible sooner for as many people as we can. And enterprise up, uh, IT upgrade cycles are really, really slow. So from my perspective, whether you use the free version of the plugin or you want to license the commercial version, we're happy to support you in that endeavor. With the commercial version, you know, a lot of people look at this in terms of a cost-benefit analysis. What we really do is help you save time to market and ongoing maintenance costs. And a plugin like this really isn't core to any product or service provider. The, the value that 
our customers bring to their end users is in the design of the application and the user experience, and it's about how you uh, facilitate uh, whatever business you're trying to support or whatever type of customer you're trying to support. A plugin is not a value add in many cases. So we've already done all the work. We're willing to do all of the maintenance. Um, we now have the momentum and um, sort of the customer base to make it worth it for us to continue to do this. Uh, I would encourage anyone out there that's looking for a solution to bring WebRTC to I and Safari to come to us first. That brings me up to the next slide, which is a number of resources you have available about the plugin and contact information for your company and the like. And uh, Chip and I have talked in the past and done several podcasts. I think if you haven't looked at this, you need to take a look at what the plugin is, at least the free version. And thank you very much, Chip, for uh, providing all this information. Thanks very much for having me, Gary. It's been a pleasure.